The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. We're live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back. It's time. It's time for the Minnesota Soccer Podcast. We accidentally took the week off last week. I promise you we were here. <laughs> sort of. That was a uh, producer issue. I'll, I'll take the blame for that one. Yeah, like they, we were, Nick and Tom were in the in the studio. I was sitting at my computer ready to go and just couldn't get it together, we, Tom. We were one button away. We had a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Luke under the bus just to throw him under the bus. <laughs> he was away on a remote. He did not return the equipment. And uh, so we were using our backup board, and I was one button away from getting the, uh, it's basically just getting the sound, right, into our headsets, so we could hear Naylor's beautiful voice, and uh, unfortunately we couldn't, and I was bummed, although luckily United had been off for two weeks at that point. I was going to say, we, we, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel a little bit last week for content, but now we have so much. And anyway, we, we don't need Luke need to deal with Luke Inman anymore because we don't we don't talk about people whose teams go out and get ties, right, guys? <laughs> oh, God. No, hey, listen, it's, it's how football is. You guys have been saying this on the show all along. <laughs> I, I don't watch <laughs> soccer because there's ties. Can you imagine if like people just stopped watching the Vikings? Be like, this is what not what I signed up for. <laughs> I mean, I just twenty nine, twenty nine. What kind of score is that? We, that's not real. That's not a real American football. Twenty nine, twenty nine uh, is uh, a, you is the it's the first time an NFL game has ever ended at that score too. Is a unique I, one of my favorite things line. while we're on ties in American football is that the Browns ended their losing streak with a tie. That was hilarious. <laughs> it's very Browns, and this was very Vikings. But very Browns to not. To end a losing streak by not winning. Yeah, exactly. As it goes. Rather like Minnesota United ending their uh, three game losing streak with a tie uh, <laughs> this weekend. So we had we had two games to go over this week, which we would have had regardless of the podcast. I think we should probably start with the one that happened first with uh, the game on Wednesday evening uh, in which Minnesota United lost to Wayne Rooney's D.C. United. And Nick, I don't think you and I talked at all after this game. What did you what did you think about Wednesday's game in, in the nation's capital? I think there was a lot of interesting talking points uh, from that game from my perspective. I think you I think there's a really interesting conversation about, you know, Angelo getting his first goal and his performance and kind of the Christian Ramirez versus Angelo debate. Uh, I think that has some some legs now and is interesting after that game. Uh, I think Fernando Bob's debut was was fascinating. I think the continued um, Heath decision making and and being kind of slow to change uh, continued on that game, and, and it was worth monitoring and discussing. And, and of course, the, the poor performance from Carter Manley and how that really hurt his team um, was interesting and, and something to talk about as well. Well, yeah, like, I think Carter Manley's a, a talking point to start with because, number one, I feel so absolutely terrible for, for Jerome Tieson. Like, I just – it kills me, man. It's his first start back in – since May, I want to say. And he pulls up less than 15 minutes into the game and has to go off. That just sucks, man. Like <laughs> – I know. It, it it does terribly. Everything I've uh, heard from Minnesota United staff as, you know, we're close to them by going to practices or going to games or talking to them or talking to the players – it, it's clear that Jerome, known as Jerry amongst all the fans and the players, is is a good dude. It's just a good guy. And well, and like he's he's around the team all the time still, even through all this time. We see him after the games outside the locker room. I've seen him up in the press box a couple of times. Like he's always around. I it's yeah it's it's it, he he's just it's clear he just exudes that vibe of being an awesome guy and a nice guy. And, yeah, like you said, it, it pains you to see it because it's just seem, seemingly unfair. Well, and and then, like, 
his absence then sets the table for the contemplation of that starting lineup in that game, which the defensive line to begin with was already one that had barely seen the light of day this season with Tyson coming back from injury for the first time, along with Mark Birch, who hadn't started a game since April, I want to say, and Brent Coleman and Wyatt Omsberg, who's played much more in the USL this year than he has in the in MLS. That's a back line that has spent little to no time together. And then 15 minutes into the game, you have to take Tyson off and bring on Carter Manley, who's been spending his time in the USL this season. Like the fact that that back four went the first half and didn't allow a goal and looked okay was remarkable for me. <laughs> Especially considering how hot DC United has has been as of late. Yeah. It's true, but I mean, it still was like it, you just knew that it would come crumbling down. It would. It was just felt it, like a matter of time, which is, frankly, how it's always felt for United on the road this season. Well, but particularly with a lineup like that, my qu- I think the first thing I said with this game, it wasn't even with the defense; it was with Maximiano. Was what is fitness going to look like for these guys, who many of whom have not been getting regular minutes this year, and. When you see DC come in, smack two goals in between minutes 60 and 70, I don't want to say that fatigue is every single reason why that happened, but boy, that was the time I was looking at it for. <laughs> well, and and my I, I felt that, I, and I wrote about that on on, uh, on the website. You guys can check it out at zonecoverage.com. When I when I evaluated this game, and and I felt that a, the a, a good portion of the squad looked tired or 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 as the game wore on, became less and less, you know, punchy and effective. And, uh, yeah, it to me screamed that not everyone was at full fitness. And I guess you could make the argument that, uh, like you say, David, a lot of these guys haven't been getting regular minutes, so how could they possibly be fully fit? But I, I, I push that they aside. They should be, though. I push like, that aside because, you, yeah, what are you doing in training then? Like, what, what are you guys – this game – came after what was it an 18 day hiatus or something like that like how what are you guys doing in that meantime if you're not fit to play one game within a three week time period like that makes no sense to me yeah so that was that was strange and then second half opens up and angelo rodriguez gets his goal which he would he was looking in the mood for the entire first half and just wasn't getting the final touch quite right gets his chance, buries it two minutes into the second half, and all of a sudden Minnesota are in the lead, and Angelo Rodriguez has his goal, which I, for one, it's been coming. I've been saying it. He's looked good, just hasn't gotten it to go in, and he got it. Yes, he, he's – like, and I, I, I've, I've felt since day one, you know, seeing him play, it, it's clear what he brings to the table. It's clear that he has uh, a full complement of abilities, and – I, I don't think, and it's the same reason that Christian struggled to score this so far this season. The team's not set up to support a striker very well, in my opinion. Yeah. And and so the fact that he struggled out of the gate is no surprise to me. I think that's why, like I just said, that's the reason Christian uh, was struggling this season too. Um, which I think you have to uh, kind of look at Heath on, on that uh, to some degree. And but but this goal to me was symbolic of a lot of things, and it was symbolic to me of the Christian versus Angelo debate because the way that this goal came about was that Angelo did a ton of work in the buildup prior to the goal and a bunch of individual skill to get to that point that Christian just frankly couldn't do. Right, Angelo used his hold up ability, which. Though Christian's was and is good, Angelo's is definitely better. Angelo used his speed and dribbling ability to create that opportunity. Christian, those are his two weakest abilities, are dribbling and speed. So yeah. this goal doesn't happen if it's Christian. And and I think that's why Angelo is what he is. And you can be frustrated that Christian's not on this team because I think that still is a fair point and a fair thing to talk about. And something, frankly, we'll be talking about until deep into next season because... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the effect's going to be felt. uh, His absence is going to be felt, potentially, and already is. And then 
what they do with the trade money will obviously be in the discussion heavily. So, but to me, Angelo has you can't be mad at Angelo as a United fan, in my opinion, because he he does clearly bring things to the table that are that are quality. The, and I I saw a, a nick a possible nickname floating around Twitter for Angelo, which was the Juggernaut, um, <laughs> because. It, it just seems like when he gets the ball and is able to keep possession of it, it's really hard to stop him from just going forward. Like, he keeps the ball, he carries his defender with him, and just does not stop. And I kind of I kind of like that. I don't know if it's going to stick, but I was, I was interested to see that kind of starting to develop given the superhero themes of... Minnesota United goal scorers <laughs> of ages past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fitting. And he kind of looks like Juggernaut. Uh, yeah. So, fair enough. I like it. The unstoppable Juggernaut, Ang- Angelo Rodriguez. Well, if they can build a, a decent team around him, then we'll see if he's unstoppable. But yeah, that's at right. At this point. So then have you have the strangest of scenarios, a Minnesota United road lead. <laughs> um, I felt very which- uncomfortable. Yeah, time. last which Looks lasts like I gotta about, shut it off. La- lasts about twenty minutes before a weird scrambly little goal by Luis Segura that kind of came out of nothing. Like it looked like a chance that was just nothing, and then it went through everybody's legs and into the goal. Like it was a really weird goal. Oh right, the one yeah, the first goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it definitely kind of like in it ho- should have gotten cleared, but like yeah, and it's definitely kind of like in that. You know the hockeyism of a garbage goal. It definitely was a bit like yeah. that, but I mean, for me, still, it, it it would later prove to be a theme that Manly was a bit of an issue, a bit of a liability, and Manly was the guy he turned and put through his legs. It, you yeah. know what I mean? So I, to me, this still felt a little bit of, of Manly's fault. And actually, for the first time in a while. I was waiting um, for this. I I I did definitely feel like that was that was also partially on Bobby Shuttleworth. Well, to continue your hockey analogy, I don't think Bobby could see anything that was going on. Like he he jumped late to it for sure, but there were so many bodies moving around in front of that that he had he had a lot less of a chance than usual to get get a good jump on it as he so often does. And and I hear you on that. And the other the other technical point that I would give as to why he was in in the wrong is he was off, if I remember correctly, he was Did he go on his wrong foot? No, he was off his line. Like he was oh, he, he, yeah. he wasn't he was farther off his line which gave him less time to react. Um and I think that was where he made a mistake. And I would also and again, you're obviously a good person to point this out to but I think anyone who watches soccer could go could understand this but would Hugo Lloris have made that save and it, and you're in the not and not only is your answer yes your answer at least in my opinion is like 10 out of 10 10 out of 10 yeah you know what I mean it's not even like it's not even like oh dang yeah like De Gea or Lloris are letting that in you know a few times like no like I can't even picture De Gea or Lloris letting that in and I know that's obviously an incredibly high it's an, bar. It's, a, it's an extremely high standard, but like... But if you're, again, as I do, I rate everyone on a scale of 1 to 10, and if De Gea and Lloris are a 10, then, yeah, Shuttleworth's falling below that in this sense. Yep. So then we have, four minutes later, the goal in which Carter Manley is much more obviously left in the dust as uh, Joseph is, Mora of is, DC United uh, escapes down the sideline on a on a long ball and just manly gets takes a bad angle completely whiffs on the ball Mora has all the time in the world to send in across that Darren Maddox comes in and finishes quality finisher no surprise and then we're back on the usual script <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I felt good again at that point. Actually, I was like, "Ooh, I can." This makes sense again. Life is yeah. normal. Uh, no, just kidding. But uh, like, uh, could you look more like a rookie you know, on one play than you know Carter did on that? You know, and and so that's tough. You know, I, I I'm all for giving young guys minutes, and especially in a season like this where it's clear postseason uh, aspirations are are low. So. I'm fine with it. I, I'm not like, you know, I wouldn't be upset with the kid, but man, obviously looking inexperienced and not well, quite ready at that point. It's a learning moment, right? Like, well, that's the hard thing is like, 
it was such a bad angle. It was like, what were you even going for? Like, I, I, I'd be really, it's too bad as an away game because I would be really interested to know, like, what he would have said as to what he was thinking on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was one of those yeah. mistakes. It's like, I don't even know what you were doing. Like, so. Well, it, it's one of those things for, for like, any of these any of these times that, whether it's Toy, who's off on loan still, but I bet is back this week. More on that later. Or Definitely more Manly or Omsberg or even uh, even Abu still like there's still so much these guys have to learn about the game and the good things and the bad things Minnesota they're at the point now where realistically the playoffs are done we've said that that's not a new point so to get Carter Manley 75 minutes of playing against an attack with Wayne Rooney and Lucho Acosta and Paul Areola like that's great that is so much better than whatever he's getting in Las Vegas like he made a dumb he made a couple of dumb mistakes yep he's a rookie it's gonna happen doesn't feel great because you're not winning the game but like these things happen to rookies right like it, it just happens. No rookie is comes in and is perfect. He honestly, I've wa- we've watched him right. We've watched him play a decent amount, like four games, I think. Four. Yeah, because he he played a good bit early in the season, and I've I've liked him honestly. I I, I, I do too. I, I've I've given him high marks, and I've been impressed. Um, and and he sh- and the thing that I think he's best at, he showed again even in this poor performance, which was his his passing. Uh, and link up play as the outside back, but uh, and his ability just to pass consistently pass forward from that position was is not necessarily easy, and he does so very well. In this game, it was just like clear, like okay, maybe that's his downside is his defending ability. But I would even venture to say, and again, I've only seen the guy play like four times, but man, I thought he just looked off, like like real off, like something was going on with him, like. He wasn't feeling right, had yeah. something, because, like, and he wouldn't have expected to necessarily play, right, as we this discussion started Especially with. not coming in as early as he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this discussion started with the fact that Jerome T.A.'s son got hurt and in the first 15 freaking minutes, so he wouldn't have expected to play, and, and man, did he look it. He looked like he was not ready, and I wonder, I just wonder what might else be going on there. <laughs> yep, that, I think that's totally fair. Did you have anything major else you wanted to hit from the DC game? Let me chickity check. Well, it was uh, Fernando Bob's uh, debut. Yeah, and, and Fernando. I think, and he's that, a story. Think, you know, a large story throughout this. Obviously, these two games. But that's the thing is like Fernando Bob and Wyatt Omsberg. I think can we can talk about both of them because I want to talk about both of them. But their stories cover both games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it'll be, it's, I, Interesting. How, I thought Fernando Bob was interesting. <laughs> you, that's I don't I don't know how to gauge interesting. What it, <laughs> that seems ambiguous. I don't, it is ambiguous. It was intentionally so. <laughs> I I don't know. I was more impressed with him in the DC game than I was um, last night against Salt Lake. I will say that. Hmm. I felt that's interesting because I felt. Even on like, I felt like I got the same vibe from him both games. Generally okay. speaking, I I would agree that he was maybe slightly. Actually, I don't know. I thought I have it written down. I basically have him like the same both All games. Right. So, I guess he drew my eye a little bit less in last night's game, but different stuff was occupying my attention during last night's game. So that might not necessarily have been his fault, right? Like, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think the rest of the players, they, all their stories that I would discuss kind of go through both games because, yeah, I think you just said Omsberg, which definitely similar performances in both games, but definitely worth discussing. And then D- yeah. Dunlady, uh definitely uh, a talking point through yeah. both games. So I'll let you pick uh, how you want to. Well, let's start with Bob because he's obviously the new guy on the block, and his we got to see the partnership with him and Maximiano in the midfield instead of the – Ibsen Schuler dichotomy that we've had for this entire season. So, right. Maximiano Bob as a partnership, I think. What did, what did you see that was a change from what's usually been seen in defensive midfield from United with the two Brazilians? Well, let me start by pointing out that I've been ripping Ibsen for the past like two weeks, <laughs> and sure enough, 
a new midfielder comes into the team and Ibsen's immediately placed on the bench. So I think that makes a ton of sense in my eyes. Um, and, and what's so funny, it's perfect because Ibsen's this 30, you know, four, 35 year old Brazilian with a lot of flair and obviously a classy guy, a classy player. I, I don't know if he's a classy guy. I've never met him, but off the field, but seems like a classy guy, definitely a classy player in his day. I just think it's not his day anymore. And what's so funny is that Fernando Bob comes in, also a somewhat elder Brazilian at 30, uh, also a center mid, and he's like, he is Ibsen without all the shenanigans, without all the head scratchers. He's just this calm player that finds the smart pass, and when he does go, he does have the go for the extravagant move every now and again, but it's timely and effective and not risking you know his team's competitiveness to do it so i think the contrast between bob and ibsen is is stark and 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 fitting i think it's a change that i that this team needed and for me my money from what i've seen for bob these two we, these two games this week i my main takeaway is that this is a guy that's going to feature prominently going forward and definitely next year like to me he is he is definitely penciled in if not penned in to the starting lineup come next season i i will say in terms of maybe a little bit of similarity to ibsen um who was the minnesota united player that caused a large gathering of rather angry yelling in the first half of the rail salt lake game Oh, that was Fernando Bob stealing the ball away from a Salt Lake guy when he was trying to take a free kick quickly and then starting to yell at people. So I like that Fernando Bob's got a little bit of an edge to him and can get under his opponent's skin, at least it appeared. That was the most one of the most interesting parts of the first half of the Real Salt Lake game. <laughs> yes. So I, I enjoyed that there's a little bit of an edge there. And so, yeah, I... I, th- I think he works. I'm interested to see if Maximiano is the right piece next to him. I've, I've actually really liked what I've seen from Maximiano these last two games as well. Like, it can be better, but, like, I think in particular he needs to work on tracking back a little bit more. But, like, moving forward, I really like what I'm seeing from Maximiano, and he started to look game fit for the first time this year, finally. Sir, like, yes, finally is right. And, and I mean, it's tough because I would agree with you that these were definitely Maximiano's best performances. Uh, that we've seen in a United shirt, most certainly. But I think com- compared to what? You know, compared to crap, yeah, like, crap performances, like, and, and, or like not even being on the field because he gets red cards, you know, or being not healthy enough to play. So, like, yes, much improved, but improvement on a scale of not that great prior. So, but, it, but it's, you got to start somewhere, right? Like, so I want to give him credit where credit is due. Like, I, and that's fair, but I guess my point, and I be, I guess I don't know how you feel about this, but the dude's like, I can't remember off top, I think like 20, and he's on loan. And so I just don't picture him being, I would be like, why, if you're, if you're Lagos or Heath, are you really like, we got to sign this guy permanently? I, I don't know that you are, unless you can get him on a really cheap deal and you've seen enough at training that you know his much better stuff is yet to come. You know, I, it's hard. You don't, I don't know. Would you resign he, him? So he's 23. Yeah. And they do. He is on a loan deal, but the club has an option to buy. Right. Um, would you buy him? I would. Really? He's 23. Like, you just mentioned Fernando Bob's 30. Like, you got to have some kind of youth somewhere in this midfield that's at a, some point. That's like, a, yeah, and that's a decent... And that's a decent point, you know. Especially because you got to feel like the price on that buy option probably isn't too bad. Like, I, it, yeah, if it, yeah, it has to be, you know, a, a you know, a decent or a, uh, a discounted rate for. It yeah, to be I wouldn't think that price all. is going to be too out of absurd. Yeah, yeah to be at all stomachable, yeah. it would need to be pretty discounted. But, but I just. I just you don't have to have him, right? You could you could not re-sign him, sign someone else, right? You could get a 23-year-old. You've seen what you get in Max Miano. And again, based on 2018, bleh. So, yeah. so, so, so why not get a different 23-year-old? You know what I mean? That would be my so point. So if, if the starting 
defensive midfield partnership next season is Fernando Bob and Rasmus Schuler with Maximiano as the primary backup. Are you content? I like that better. I definitely see, and that's the thing. I definitely. I don't think it's a good sign that if you told me going into next season, Max Miano and Fernando Bob were starting next to each other as defensive midfielders, and I would be like, ugh, not feel like you should. That's not how you should feel. If 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 I picture him as a starter and I don't like it, why would I want that guy on my team? Like it's you know what I mean. I don't. He definitely yeah. I mean, as a backup, I'm I could I could live with that um, because I could believe that he's got more upside than we've seen. So I'll give you that. And and I like the idea of Bob and Schiller together. Yeah, that's that's a partnership I want to see before the end of the season just to see like playing there's there's a degree of you you can expect better communication playing the two Brazilians together there might be a better degree of familiar, familiarity with them, but probably Schuler and Bob would be your best partnership moving forward. And so if he's going to put that out there, I want to see what that looks like. Because that seems like it could have some good stuff going on. To me, to me though, if you really want to be right, if you're if you're roster building, if you really want to be good, you need to have either a really stout set up, you know, starting group, or you need to have, and you just should have decent depth. And to me, wouldn't you be how much better of a team does Minnesota United sound like if you have a guy like Bob or Schuller as the guy who's on the bench? Right, and and we've talked about this numerous times. I think they should bring in a center mid as their next DP. So why, yep. how how much better of a team do they sound like if you have you can if you need to rely on off off an injury or a, a, a yellow card suspension? If you could bring Bob or Schuller off the bench into the starting lineup rather than have those two there and bring in some unknown unknown guy. Yep, I think that's totally fair. I I will say that like. I think that's still a perfectly valid thing to consider. I wouldn't be crushed if they went into next season with Bob Schuler as the starting center mids. I could. Work when you with say that. it like that, it uh, sounds yeah, yeah. like they're one guy. That, that, not only that, Schuler Bob. But Bob. I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't be crushed. Is very like a Minnesotan take on something. Like I wouldn't be crushed if Latron Laquan Treadwell was on the team next week. <laughs> I could live with it. Like maybe they're not going to go win MLS Cup immediately with that, but like. Yeah. But again, I like no, and I think that's a I think that could be a decent midfield combo. But what happens if one of them got injured? Yeah, then are you? And you have the infinite, next... in, infinite, in, limitless upside of Max Miano to come <laughs> off the bench, or the infinite <laughs> possibilities of shenanigans that Ibsen provides. Yep. <laughs> So st- stepping back, I I do want to talk about Wyatt Omsberg because let's let's do it. I just want to say one more point. What, say, how one more nice p- how nice does this Minnesota United lineup start uh, or lineup sound? Angelo Rodriguez as the striker, Darwin Quintero as the attacking mid, Kevin Molino as the right mid, Miguel or Romario Ibarra as the left mid, or Ethan Finley. Right, all three of those guys compete for the other side, and then you have Fernando Bob, a DP center mid. And then Brent Coleman, Michael Boxall, Francisco Calvo at left back, um, Carter Manley after he's like gotten like tons of one-on-one work with the best with like uh, Hector Bellerin or Antonio Valencia, and then uh, and Bobby Shuttleworth. That's a good team. That's an interesting team. That's a playoff potential team. And so, I guess again, my main point being. Bring in a, a DP center mid, and you got yourself a team. I've got some thoughts about that, but I want to talk about Wyatt Amsberg first. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, you you talked about the the defensive. I just depth. made an MLS and, Cup worthy team, and you want look, okay? Yeah, I'm, and I'm going to talk about the depth behind that team. Okay. Because you just talked about the depth possibilities if you bring in a designated player center mid. Great. You still have to have depth. We, Lord knows we've heard Adrian Heath talk about the depth and the signings for every post game for most of this season. Wyatt Omsberg looks almost comfortable at this level already. And for the minutes that he's played, that is awesome to have in reserve. Like, if you think, like, if we think about the, the center backs that the club currently has employed between... Calvo, 
Coleman, Boxel, and Omsberg is the fourth. I'm okay with all four of those guys on the pitch in pretty much any combination of orders. Like, which, that's awesome. That's really, really good to have. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely one of the takeaways from this weekend is is Wyatt and that he he stood in there and and he was pretty darn good and like he took care of business. None like. of yeah, and none of the goals uh, were at all his fault, um, which is a is definitely obviously a, a positive. And you didn't like you didn't like see him do anything like oh I don't know Carter did and make you go oh that's a rookie. That's a rookie right there. Like, well, yeah, and that's that's the, that's such the easy contrast because we just talked about Carter making these rookie mistakes, just being out of position, looking off the pace. There was none of that in 180 minutes from Wyatt Omsberg this weekend. Not not a moment that I could point to. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And I and uh, <laughs> I've said this about Wyatt before too. I it's center backs are an inch. They're really difficult to grade because so often the play does is like supposed to be away from them, like. If the ball is on a center back, you're hopefully moving it away from him soon, right? If he gets it in his own box, he's clearing it. it all his, all of the de- the center back's mechanisms are to like not have the play around him, and so it's hard to grade their ability. And I just, again, I, I definitely give him positive marks for this week, but it's one of those things where like you'll never, you won't really know what you have in him until you have. You just have to have like a ten game sample size, at least, to have a real confident grade. But again, this week's signs definitely looks pretty good right now. So, and it relates to what my dream eleven for Minnesota United going into next year would be, because Wyatt Omsberg features in my lineup. Um, because I want to live a dream of podcasts past, as. <laughs> My starting lineup for next season would feature a 3-5-2, Minnesota United's most successful formation of this season, um, with Darwin Quintero and Angelo Rodriguez up top. So, no changes up there. In the midfield, you would have Kevin Molino as an attacking midfielder, and um, Rasmus Schuller and your designated player, defensive midfielder, starting in the defensive midfield. You'd have Miguel Ibarra at one wing back and Ethan Finlay at the other. Oh, wait. Yeah, no, that adds no, up. No, actually, I don't need your, I don't need your, um, your designated playing, player, defensive midfielder, because at defensive midfielder next to Rasmus Schuller, I'm starting Francisco Calvo. Um, okay, nice. Nice. Fair. And then your three at the back are. Uh, Amsberg and Boxel and Coleman. You Boom. you just want Wyatt so you can move Calvo. I see what this yes, is. Yes, I do. About. Yes, I, I want see. To move Calvo up. I see what this is all about. That all the Wyatt love was secondary was really secondary to your love for Calvo. You caught. I got gotcha. you. You you <laughs> caught me because that transitions onto one of my points from the DC, from the Salt Lake game. Calvo on the ball was awesome. Oh wow! News flash: We've known it's like this. He's good at that when he's going forward. Oh my gosh! How do you watch that dude play with the ball at his feet, and you're like, "Yeah, let's put him in the position that should have the ball at their feet the least." <laughs> like what? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and like, he, oh, he's oh, just oh! Also, he plays on the ball where he splits two defenders, hits perfect, flawless long balls for. Darwin to chase. Uh, like, <laughs> also, said guy plays for another team that's much better than this one, and it's called the Costa Rican national team, and he plays out in that position for them. <laughs> like, he's already doing it for a better team. Just follow what the better team's doing. What? Yeah, I, I don't understand that at all. Just put him in the midfield. Uh, I've been saying this since March. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and on – yeah, just midfield – or outside back, at le- just one of those, and he'll be able to feature a lot more on the ball. Just well, at least one of those. Point, and the point does go back to Wyatt. You have three other center backs that you could feel comfortable starting in an MLS game. You don't need him to play center back anymore. You arguably never did because Brent Coleman is a dude that's good at soccer. But like, yeah, 
No, I, I that was the funniest thing. That's what's so peculiar about the Salt Lake game is it was an all you can eat center back buffet. He played four <laughs> the quad. He played four center backs. Like that that to me was symbolic of so many things. Like he hates Boy, the comments when that lineup came out were just hilarious. <laughs> I didn't see any of them, but I I can imagine cuz a lot of them cropped up in my head. A lot of what in the hell is that? <laughs> it's just like yeah, I mean, I think this is this is the first time he's ever played Calvo. Uh, he started Calvo out of position, right? I think there was times where he's maybe moved him a little bit during a game, but this is the first time he's ever started him. At, like, left back. At left yeah. back, yeah, which I think is, like, is a positive because that's it's a landmark move. Like, that's the first time he's done that. Um, I think, you know, I guess in my head, famously, I asked Adrian if he'd ever play Calvo out of position earlier in the season when we first started having this conversation, and Adrian scoffed it off and was like, no, not this season. And boom, he did it this season. And it's like, and, and again. I heard he had a callback to that moment. He was like, remember when Nick Howard asked me about uh, <laughs> He texted Tom like, you yeah, he's like, he's like I, I, yeah, Nick was right. I've been reconsidering it. I think Nick might be on something. And that David guy he talks to on the airwaves, he's kind of on to something there, too. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're the actual brain trust. Adrian Heath just texts us all the time. That's actual fact. Don't yeah. tell people that yet. They're not winning yet. Yeah, yeah, we look yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, dude. N- Nick also told uh, Spielman about uh, Carlson. So <laughs> he's got some amends to make. <laughs> so so there, there's my Calvo rant. I needed to get that out. That was important. Um. But it's exciting. Is, it's exciting because maybe he's coming. He's coming around on it, and that's definitely positive. And maybe to your point, maybe why it's performing uh, performances or Brett's performances or um, Boxall I, or the form what formation? Because I again, I've I've kind of put my money quietly. You know, well, not so quietly, but I've kind of put my money on that he goes back to the four five one next season. And so within that, you'd only have two center back spots and. Brett, uh, Brett Coleman's really cheap, um, so you'd want to play him, and he's done really well. And you have Boxall, who's solid. So yeah, it kind of makes sense. You're also your weakest, by far your weakest set of positions is outside back as a whole, both right yep. and left. So yeah, maybe it's making more and more sense to him to play Calvo out, out left. Like, there was a moment in the second half of this game where Calvo. <clears throat> I'm still not actually sure how he got there, but he was at the top of the 18-yard box like a striker trying to square and shoot, but it was on his wrong foot, so he just didn't get the shot off. But he's he's everywhere when he wants to be, and it, it, it makes Heath pull his hair out a little bit, but if he's going to do it, just put him in a position where he gets to go forward, and it won't ruin the rest of your formation. It's easy. <laughs> Seriously, and yeah, no, and, he, and he's just clearly comfortable there, and he makes really awesome plays. As you alluded to, a couple of really nice balls. Uh, up to the forwards at times. A couple of nice combination plays to get up the field. And at times where, like, United was kind of like, they are kind of pressing. And he just, like, he's so, that's the thing. Like, you can just, you can tell a lot about a soccer player at any level is how they handle when they get pressed high up the field or at all. And, man, dude is cool as a cucumber in that situation. And, yeah. And that says a lot. He's just comfortable on the ball. It's like it's so fun to watch. Like there, there, there was a moment that, it, that didn't turn into anything, but he, he had the ball along the sideline, and he had two different Salt Lake players trying to press him, and he just kind of got away from him and passed it away, just outskilled him. And that's just one of those things that it's like you know you want a guy who can do that. That just solves so many pressure problems. Which the first half of this game was not great for minnesota united in that terms they looked every bit as bad as they've looked in any point on this road trip not not <clears throat> not not to mention that what would you what could you argue is calvo's weakest part of his game his perhaps it, his defensive positioning his defensive positioning and the mistakes that he makes <laughs> and the worst place to put someone who has that is center back oh my god move him in yep. my in my dream in my dream eleven for next year, I if we recall, I also put him on the team, but at left back. So you put him on you put him at left back. I'm moving a step forward. Yeah, that's bold. I like it. So 
let's have the sad conversation. Do uh, we see Abu Ladi on the field again this season? Uh, I'm going to make it uh, more. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to make it more. Are sad, you going to go there? I, I wondered if you're going to go there. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to make it a bit more uh, permanent. I'm struggling to think of the another word for sad that I wanted to use. Uh, morose. It's a bit more morose oh, wow. from my perspective. I frankly, I frankly don't. I don't know that he is gonna be, can be, or is gonna be anything for this franchise. I think yeah. you can really, actually, have to start asking yourself that question. This guy came out of college into the MLS Super Draft in 2017 and it was clear to many people he was the top prospect talent wise. The one knock on him was that he can't stay healthy. That was literally what scouts had about him is that he can't stay healthy and his two years in MLS have only corroborated that. Like that is clear. His his, the last two seasons have just proven his fragility more and more and so it, you have to have Here's a real. Question. You have to have a real conversation that this guy may never be able to be on the field regularly. I, and I think I think that's interesting because this is something we've tracked. I feel like since he got drafted, my question is like Molina went out and what's the guy from Duluth who Finley? Got, Finley. So the difference there is that's a single incident injury, and that's why you're less concerned about their future. Exactly. Than okay. They did their ACLs, which happens. It's been hamstring after hamstring after hamstring after hamstring when you see Don Lottie pull up after 24 minutes in this game and grab at his hamstring immediately it's just like oh my god not again like dude because it's the same thing oh yeah that's uh, yeah that's obviously much worse the trend of an injury worse than obviously a few major injuries in your career um and yeah, dude, like I'm not even kidding you guys. I literally, I'm so excited to watch this guy. Like I enjoy covering this team because I'm a soccer guy and I've been doing it for, for zone coverage for years. And when it comes to watching him play, I get legitimately excited because his potential and his speed is so electric. And I'm not even kidding. When I was watching this game, this was his first start in a while. Um, he was playing striker. Um, well, it's the same way when I watched the Thursday game because that at outside mid was his first start in a while. And then he started... Uh, last night at striker and I swear to you guys I was watching this game and every time he runs I like my head's like oh, I hope he doesn't get hurt every time he sprints my head thinks that and I kid you and I thought it the whole Thursday game played awesome linked up play really well uh, and then to that the other night he, he looked decent in the start and sure enough pulls his hamstring dude it's I, I it's clearly a problem. And what's scarier to me, if you think about it, this dude was at UCLA, came out of the draft, number one over pick, almost one rookie of the year. You don't think every single person in his life, including every person in this franchise, is doing what they can to keep him healthy, right? Like the diet, the stretches, the yoga, the exercises, the fitness work. They're all working. All of them. His mom, his friends, everyone is hoping to help this kid stay healthy and are doing whatever they can, and it's not enough. You know what I mean? Like, they know this is his problem, and this still happens. It's never going to stop because they must be, right? They must be doing everything to prevent this. Yep. It's, it's clearly his anatomy. The broadcast reported that he felt a pop, which isn't great, isn't the most technical medical thing, but the, we have five weeks of the season left. My expectation is that we hear that Mason Toy was recalled from Colorado Springs this week, and that Abu's done for the year. Like, right? And and uh, you just shut him down at this point. There's no reason to play him. Yeah, no, no, no. I had a hamstring uh, pop sensation actually fairly recently. It's actually my most uh, recent in like long term injury, and it took took uh, six weeks. At minimum. So. Yeah, like I feel like four to six weeks is the usual prognosis for a hamstring thing. And at that point, like why bother maybe maybe trying to bring him back for the L.A. game last week of the season? Like, for sure, for sure. It's, it's not worth the risk. Uh, uh, totally. My problem is like if you're Adrian Heath, how do you build – like you're going to go into this offseason. Arguably Adrian Heath's most important offseason of his career. Definitely – you could argue is the most important offseason of Manny Lagos' career. You're going into a new stadium. You need this roster to be thorough. And you had to deal with the season-ending injuries of Molino and Finley. 
how can you feel good and confident in building a roster and leaning on Dunlady at all? So uh, my question, going to the stadium thing too, is it a big deal if Molino and Finley, I mean, who are the stars that for sure Quintero, but and is Rodriguez? I yeah, mean, who are the yeah. st- who are the stars that you you promote to get people? I know that they're actually selling the stadium out anyways, but to get people interested in the in the team in the new stadium, it seems like they have a handful. Does it matter that you missed on your pick then? It's not about that. It's not about promotional efforts. They have plenty. You're right. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. have plenty of guys for promotional efforts and to be a good team, a good yeah, enough and team. even the talent. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but but. We're going to crumb up in, into tricky spots next year because, again, the reason they traded Christian Ramirez, which, I don't know if you guys recall, resulted in the biggest backlash they've ever seen as a franchise, essentially. And and they did so, Heath, out of Heath's own mouth, was because of Dunlady. Because they they were blocking each other, right? He couldn't play Dunlady because Ramirez was there and they needed more strikers. They brought in Angela, right? It doesn't fit. And so now you've traded... One of the players everyone loved the most because of Dunlady. Now, you're going to play a, a formation that might only have one striker, but if Angelo needs a rest, goes down, isn't performing, your next person up was going to be Dunlady. And, and, and potentially, years down the road, he's maybe supposed to be the franchise player, right? The number one overall pick. Yeah. And now, to me, that is all unbelievably under question. Like, all of a sudden, you have a trade you can point to. You're like, yeah, that's a Minnesota sports trade. You know? <laughs> and, like, a Minnesota sports situation. Is he, is he killing it with uh, LAFC? Ramirez? Uh, I haven't seen his last two games, but he definitely debuted in fantastic fashion. Which... Na- Naylor, do you know? He, he hasn't been playing a lot, which isn't really a surprise. We talked about that when the trade happened. Like, he just... they That club is a stacked roster. There's no reason he needs to play every game. Like... So it's not a David Ortiz or like a Randy Moss or something like that. Not immediately. <laughs> I I think maybe he's well, Randy Moss. It, he's delayed. What one year well, delay? I was gonna. Well, I was gonna say like it. It, it honestly, I think is gonna depend on what they do with him moving forward. Yeah, like he he came in for 15 minutes in their game on Saturday and played and had a shot on goal, but like he's played. And, yeah, he's played in five games, started three, um, played 240 minutes, and scored two goals, both in his first game, if I remember right. So, like, he hasn't been immediately burning it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he scored two goals on his home debut. That's pretty fire. But Yeah, yeah. and then hasn't done anything since. Well, fair <laughs> enough, but yet. So you're talking more from an image. So it seems like they've collected. No, no, I mean, I'm got, talking about from a the... roster building standpoint. Like, what do you do if someone you want to rely heavily on is like clearly, but it mightily struggles to stay on the field, dude? He sure. pulls his hamstring, at like already three times this season, yeah. and that's a six week injury every time. Yeah, how could it, you it's, ever rely? It's to on the that? point where you can't start him. Like, yeah, he cannot. It, he is. Oh, he is. Yeah, you cannot have him closer. anywhere near your starting lineup premonitions. And the ceiling for a super sub, a career super sub, like to declare him that at 22 feels awful. But what are you supposed to do when he can't stay on the field? I, and, like, and I think and I think even that, like, it's a decent idea considering the circumstance. But think the best super subs are guys who are like 29, 28, 30, 31 and have like established – at some point in the career, they were the guy, like consistently it, it's, leading it's, scorer of a team, and then they went to this other team that was already like stacked with someone. So then they come off and help. Dun- that's the problem. Is like he can't even be a super sub necessarily because he doesn't have the experience of scoring twenty goals three seasons in a row at age twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, and now at twenty eight, he's the super sub for some team. Right? He needed that experience. He needs that game time to even get to that. So to me. I, I feel bad for the front office because I, I don't know of a conundrum worse than this. Because you have an asset, but you don't know how much of that asset you actually can utilize. Well, and the contract data is so much less readily available for MLS than it is for some of the other sports leagues around here. Like, I could go to the NBA and I could see exactly contract value, length, team options, player options, etc. I It's hard to find that for the MLS. So, so this is, I mean, it's hard to dig through all the tape to see what it is. 
you got to have real questions about Abu's next contract. And I don't know when that happens, but like, I, well, what do you pay him? I, and and I don't think that's as big of a problem because MLS guys are unfortunately for them, oh, a lot, most of them on short term deals. The, yeah. And don't get paid. Right. Much. This yeah. isn't. Yeah. This isn't. Uh, so I want to go back to your super sub point though, because you said these tend to be you said players in their thirties aren't what they once were, but benefit from their experience, which is not unheard of, heard of in other sports. For sure. My first analogy I thought of was like a closer in baseball that I think of like locally, Joe Nathan, not a great starter, but made a good career for himself as a closer. However, it doesn't seem like it works that way in soccer. Like it seems like that experience is vital where you really don't really need the experience of a starter to be a good closer. You more need like stuff and a mentality. But yeah, true. But even look at that. A lot of like closers were um, failed like starters. failed starters. And so what they do the whole time they're starting pitched a ton of innings, a.k.a. got a ton of experience. Yeah. Yeah. It just feels a little different. And that, so, yeah, with, Dun- with Dunlani, I don't think the contract is concerned, unfortunately, for a lot of these MLS guys don't get paid a ton and are on short-term deals. This is not your NHL where guys are getting 10 years. Your Zach Parise is getting 11-year yeah, yeah, yeah. contract. It's not or that. Or baseball. Baseball is that, Or yeah. baseball with huge number. It's not that. So I don't think the finance is the problem for United's front office in this situation. The, pro- the, the, the problem is opportunity cost. You had a first overall pick, and you spent it on this guy. Had you not, sure. right? If he if he flames out, can never stay healthy. That asset was wasted. Do you guys know off the top of your head, other players are drafted around there, and if they're like killing it, um, I could bring it up real quick if you want. I I I have a vague notion again because I covered that draft, and I know none of those guys in that draft class are all stars, and like murdering it, um, but they definitely have promising futures. The best like. The best ever first overall picks in the MLS draft, probably Maurice Adu is the top of the list, who was the number one pick in 07. Uh, like Andrew Farrell, Andre Blake, and Kyle Lauren have all been named to all star teams, um, who were 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, LAFC picked Joao Moutinho first this year. Um, yeah, like it's it's is, weird is, for MLS because you don't necessarily get the household names from the draft. Yeah, Correct. so my, my question is this is this like I don't know if you guys saw, but I think Justin Patton just had uh, foot surgery again. This is the player that the Wolves took with that 16 pick. Yeah. And it seems like he was like this c- cool guy who could have been like the the big guy with the guard talent or whatever because of the growth spurt. But it seems like he may just not pan out. Like his foot just might be messed up. Exactly. Is that, is that a similarity? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. that is exactly what this is like. Okay. You like that analogy, Naylor? Yeah, I'm into that. Yeah. <laughs> Except- yeah, good job bringing up another miserable Minnesotan draft pick on his second year in the league. Yep. Great. <laughs> uh, Can't wait to cover Justin Patton not playing in Iowa this year. Um <laughs> That is perfect, considering Naylor is the Iowa yeah. Wolves reporter now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I was looking forward to maybe seeing Patton actually play some minutes this year. Nope, foot surgery again on his other foot. Um, oh my gosh, which is terrible for a big man, by the way. Um, but, uh, let's just while we're in the NBA, let's go to one other analogy. There again, of course, there's the somewhat possibility that Abu could be Joel Embiid. Right, the injury-prone guy that no one thinks is ever going to play yeah. in glass becomes an all-star and potentially massive piece, right? But at this point, to me, that's pretty far-fetched. Let's say that Abu doesn't have the physical tools that Joel Embiid does, and leave it at that. <laughs> I, I, that's I, a, yeah. What do you mean? I think from a comparison standpoint, he would be a, a Joel Embiid comp in the MLS. His speed is super elite, just like Embiid's size is super elite. <laughs> Is his finishing that elite? It could be. Can, can you develop that as a super sub, or does that not work that way? The ability to fit now. You can't. Okay. I think it's unfair to call him a super sub because he's not been super. What, I, I'm fully saying, what super if they, yet. What if they? Okay. You know. I yeah yeah okay. Okay, let's let's step back and look at this game, Nick. Halftime of this game, Real Salt Lake leads one nothing. What did you think the final score would be? Yeah, I mean, it, it 
you assumed it would go down the away road uh, that we all know and go to two, three nil and call it a night. Um, it was okay. impressive. Se- Seventy-five minutes into the game, what did you think the final score was going to be? Um, <laughs> Tom, Tom liked that one. Thought that was a poignant question. Um. When it was one one, when it, before it before it even got to one one, like fifteen minutes to go, they've been knocking on the door a little bit, but eh. <laughs> well, yeah, I thought, pr- thought it'd probably finish one nil. Yep. Is it, the point I'm trying to make is this game was so weird. <laughs> like this, just this felt like another one of these games, and then all of a sudden in the 85th minute, Minnesota just gets on the back of. The caped crusader himself, my boy oh, Miguel Ibarra. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> Who, the first goal was an awesome finish, chipping over um, Nick Romano after Romano had absolutely wrecked Romario Ibarra one on one earlier in the game. Classy um, finish. It was a classy finish. The second goal. I thought was an even classier finish. It was nice. No, couple, couple of class, not, it, couple of classy finishes from an average player. Oh, <laughs> you are a hater! <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> like I know Batman is an extremely average superhero, but come on, man. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. Like it, I'm, I when I'm I definitely when I wrote it. Sorry. I'm when I wrote about this Joker. game last night on ZoneCoverage.com, it, it just, like, it felt so disjointed and not, like, like, I thought United had been awful for a large portion of this game, and yet Salt Lake only ever got the one goal. They never really got, like, they hit the post once, and Shuttleworth had to make one big save, but, like, they weren't, like, knocking on the door for the entire game. And Minnesota had really good chances for a while, it turned out. And then Ibarra finishes one, then finishes a second one that gets called back from offsides. And all of a sudden, like, they probably should have won this game, which is really strange. It is. It is. And, uh, and Salt Lake comes in pretty hot. Um, pretty hot and really good at home. Like, they're yeah. a great home team, not least because of the altitude factor. For sure, and it's why uh, my yet unpublished ratings from that game uh, come out as pretty darn, like, relatively po- pretty positive on the whole because this was a game on the road, because, as you point out, it's a game where they were kind of up against a good opposition and didn't seem to really have a good, you know, chance, especially as the game went on, and then they pull out a result and actually could have won it. Um I think, you know, considering a draw, they actually had guys who, for the most part, played pretty darn well overall. Did you agree with the use of VAR on Minnesota's second goal? Like, should they have used VAR or how did what? what? Like how it was used, the entire process behind it. It seems like it's become pretty clear that it was the right call. But like how the process played out didn't seem like a great look on the league. Because... Because why? It took forever. It was not well communicated to the players, the broadcast, or anyone what the call was. The broadcast thought that the the review was for a foul in the buildup to oh. the goal, which there oh. wasn't one. Let me say something about that because <laughs> yeah, here. to me <laughs> – that was, there was not one. That was comical, like that they didn't realize that it was a, because of offsides. Like I, don't, I was like, "Are you guys like okay? Like, are you kidding me?" Like, I immediately was like, "Like, literally, as that play that's unfolded, the only thing it could have been right." Like, that, that's the other thing. One immediately as the play unfolded, I was like, "Ooh, I don't know if Darwin's onside." Oh, Miguel scored. Nice goal. Da, 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 da. We're reviewing it. Oh, let's see if Darwin was on sides. And the whole time during this long review process, as Naylor just pointed out, they're like, well, I don't know what could be going on. Like, oh, my God. Like, was there a foul? And they're, like, looking at it. And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, what? Literally the first second, I was like, I don't know if that dude's on sides. And, like, they had three minutes. And they didn't even bring, they didn't even bring offsides up. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, it took until play had resumed before they figured it out. Because but like, Jamie Watson told them. 
Yeah. No, what? Well, that it, was the only way they found out. And, and the other, the Unreal. other thing is, the, the thing that kind of annoys me about it is Jamie interviewed Miguel. Interviewed. Jamie interviewed Miguel after the game, and he said that the players also weren't getting very much communication at all about what was going on on either side. So, like that. That bugs me a little bit. Like, that's, I guess, and I'll give you that. That's a little unfair. Like, the ref should be able to go, it was offsides. Like, that's not hard, you know. <laughs> he should just say that to them. Yeah. We were, well, and like, hey, so- what happened, ref? Because he reviewed, you know, he went to the review booth, came back, and was like, no, goal, goal. He, I mean, what happened? He, he was offsides. Just freaking say that. That's obvious. Like, okay, now we know. Well, but I don't think the call was that obvious, right? Like I do. I, I don't. The, I like, saw it right if away. If Maximiano hits that, it doesn't matter. Uh, I guess, yeah, and Jamie did bring that up on the broadcast. If which... Maximiano hits the he- flick on header at all, which it looked like he was within a hair's breadth of doing, it's not offsides and the goal's good. Yeah, that's a decent point, Um, <laughs> uh, I guess, you, you know, because like... He might have, um, and I and again I think Jamie's point was you know decent to the fe- the effect of like you ruled it a goal live. How can you conclusively say that this doesn't touch Maximiano? It, well, yeah, and that was Cal Molson's point was that this didn't seem like a review that was clear and obvious, which is the wording that's been used by the MLS. No, and no, the the but the ruling is also, and I know that is in the in the verbiage. But the yeah. ruling is also four things will always be reviewed, and goals are one of them. So I yeah. think it's it's like because uh, I think it's a new rule in the NFL where every touchdown is reviewed. Yeah, I think that's a while back, but yeah, and you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's the same. I think every I goal think is reviewed. Ho- don't they do that in hockey briefly? I don't know. I, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Like. So so to me, it's not like that doesn't apply because it was a goal. So then it does need to be reviewed. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it was. It just it felt like the process could have been streamlined a little bit more and more clearly communicated. But like, it's still everybody's still learning how this works. Yeah. So. And I was frustrated because they didn't. And maybe this is where you know the broadcast team, you know the guy, the uh, Callum and Kendra in the booth would have been frustrated. Is that they never at any point showed a clear angle, like of like what the ref was looking at. And I thought that was even part of VAR was that you're supposed to be able to. See what's going on in the booth. Yeah, yeah. You like, can like, what are they looking at? You can like cut to the booth specifically yeah. to see what he's looking at. So that part also, yeah, was a bit off. And I know that's a thing in cricket, but that's um, <laughs> seriously in in cricket they have a full video review system to determine a number of things. You actually on the TV broadcast, you not only get exactly what the referees looking at on video but you get the conversation between the main referee and the video referee like you get all the audio you get all the video you get everything i can't even i don't even know what to do the fact that you're referencing cricket that's just i'm just flabbergasted it's a it's it is the best review system i've seen in any sport I, like, I, I love this clear. Take. I'm so I mean, proud are, of you for watching are, cricket, I guess. We are uh, an hour and two seconds into the podcast. I love this in-depth <laughs> cricket take. This is what people stick around for. <laughs> Dude, I, and, and what are you listening to? Dro- I can drop knowledge on any sport you want me to drop it on. I've got this. What are you doing? Listen to the Minnesota Soccer Podcast. They're this about to talk cricket about cricket podcast now. I know I'm they're taking g- over. I know they're going to get to cricket at some point. I'm going to listen to the end. <laughs> These guys love right. these guys I, love I, these guys love their cross sport references. I know they'll get I, that one that of these may days. be the deepest cross sport and I love that Naylor has conviction on this. This <laughs> may be the deepest cross sport re- reference on the show. I'm serious. It's really good. Like I'll I've got to find some YouTube of it so you guys can check it out sometime. He's, enjoy. I think this his, needs to be a zone coverage article. His confidence in it is real. It makes you believe it. it. Sounds like how I the conviction I have when I try to explain to a girl that frozen yogurt is a legitimate date option. Oh, you like that fro yo? You like going to that cherry berry? He only, he only goes after uh, two free throws are missed in Wolves game. Uh, David like that we're, one. We're, we're, we're pretty far off the rails. It's probably time to yeah, call Yeah, we probably it need good. to wrap this up. Yep. So two points from 15 on the road trip. They're out of the playoff race. Eh. Not particularly surprising, right? All eyes towards 2019. And yep, Allianz Field. 
we have, I think, five or six more games at least to go. I know they have home games each of the next two weekends and each of the two weekends after that. The club is obviously promoting the last game against LA Galaxy on October Sunday, October 21st, because they want to break the state attendance record for a soccer game, which means they got to get 50,000 people into TCF Bank Stadium, which is its full capacity. So they're making a huge ticket push with that, trying to get everybody in the house. It's going to be quite an occasion as the club's last game at TCF Bank Stadium, at least for now. Um, And, like, they get to go home for the first time since August 4th and actually play a game in front of their home fans against the Portland team that got spanked this week. So they might actually look kind of good. I'm excited. Well, you did a good job selling it. I'm interested. I love it. I love it. Hopefully they play yeah. cricket highlights. And that have to. the most important thing, I'll be back in Minnesota for the first time since I moved for the game on a Saturday. So I'm excited to get back to cover the game live. What? <laughs> Welcome back to a real state. Well, glad right? Oh, wow. Oh, God. <laughs> I... I I, I would argue more, but nah. you lie. Yeah, exactly. I really, yeah. Exactly. I really want Naylor to be the 50,000th person or whatever the record is. Like, walks into the stadium, we're like, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, so club plays on Saturday against the Portland Timbers at TCF Bank Stadium. You can read Nick and I's coverage of that on zonecoverage.com. You can eventually read Nick's player ratings of Saturday's game on zonecoverage.com. My recaps. All of the above. Tom, anything else we got going on that we should know about? We got some tying Vikings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tying Vikings. No, I mean, in all seriousness, Sam was out there in Green Bay at Lambeau Field. Uh, Got great video from the locker room. Great analysis. Um, I understand, you know, we may not not have all Vikings. Did he talk talk to the kicker? Yeah, yeah. Daniel Carlson came out and talked. Uh, Yeah, he's done great road coverage. He will also be in Philly as well. I uh, look for Dane Moore's podcast and his series on him and uh, Charlie Johnson on each player from the Minnesota Timberwolves. That Vikings game should set up a fantastic machine podcast. Yeah, Football Machine Wednesday. Ooh, that's going to be uh, interesting. Yeah, no, a lot, a lot of good stuff. Still, uh, I always bring this up, still sticking with the Twins. Martin, <laughs> uh, Brandon and I still talking about that team, although not as exciting as the Vikings United, the Wolves. <laughs> well, and, and the Wilds Wild. preseason starts this week, don't they? Yeah. Like, they're actually getting into their preseason now. Yeah, so so Heather should still be on that, as well as Giles and Ben. They'll return with their podcast. So a lot of good stuff. It's after kind of a, a slow summer, especially with the Twins not doing as well as they expected. Um we finally have a lot of interesting stuff uh, on the site, so check that out. And the Gophers are undefeated. Gophers are undefeated. Gopher football, let's as, go. As the uh, yeah, I think I you know I was talking to Nick, proud uh, Gopher alum. He thinks it's the undefeated season. <laughs> uh, he does not. Yeah, that <laughs> that <laughs> but, is f- and actually fake Mar- news. Martin Martin Schlegel is also uh, stepping in with some Gopher football coverage. But yeah, a lot of exciting stuff. Definitely check out the site. I think this is one of our most exciting podcasts after kind of a, a lull after you well, know, two weeks the off. team was maybe playing. it's good that we took That's a week true. off. We had a lot. We had a lot of content to plug in today. I, I want to point this out. David Naylor, positive about this in my corner. Nick Hallett, just coming at me right now. <laughs> Get some. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready to hour two. Just hot take, hot take, hot take. Hour two. We're opening up the phone, phone lines. Nick, Nick, just get on Periscope and give the people what they want. Come on. <laughs> oh, that, I should do that. It'd be fun. <laughs> All right. Here's what I have to say about this. We need to wrap this up, Naylor. We're, we're well off the road. I, I, I'm trying. Believe me. Someone cut my mic. <laughs> yeah. Cut Nick's. Yeah. Just unplug Nick right now. Anyway, Nick Hallett. Find him on Twitter at Prince Hallett. Don't listen to him ever. Uh <laughs> Tom Schreier, T. Schreier 3, myself, David Naylor, at Prop Cedar. We'll see you guys next week. Take care.